Did you ever have your fortune told? I mean, fortune teller invariably begins with a thorough shuffling of the deck. And then they always take the precaution of having you cut the deck. And then, by gum, we start reading the cards. Ooh, that's a very grim card, I'm sure. Ah, there's a pretty one. Hmm. Now that tells me you're all budding statisticians. Yes, yes. Uh-oh. Now that tells me that rare events are never going to happen to you. And so it would go. Now, of course, if we could tell fortunes, there would be no necessity for us uh, learning anything about statistics, because uh, we could tell the outcome, predict the future. Uh, we could anticipate the answer to any question which the experiment would raise, and it'd be unnecessary to run the experiments. I'll tell you one thing we have in common with fortune tellers, though, statisticians, and that is we always start out by thoroughly shuffling the deck because, you know, by gum, some aspect of randomization has to attach itself to every experiment. And one easy way to randomize things is to, you know, use a deck of cards and get them thoroughly shuffled. Well, this brings us uh, then to a quick review of the kinds of experimental designs we've been talking about up to now. The various kinds we've actually in had two kinds of experimental designs so far. The completely randomized design. Now, this is a situation in which there are K treatments, and what we're doing is we are, we plan to run a certain number of uh, observations in each treatment. If there were four treatments and five observations for each treatment, we'd make up 20 little slips of paper, and on each one of the, each set of five, uh, uh, we'd put one or the other of the letters. We'd mix them all up and draw them, and that's how we would collect our data. And so that's why it's called a completely randomized experiment. The mathematical model appropriate for that kind of an experimental design is the one we see here, where we have the mean, uh, the treatment effects, and the errors. And as always, we assume these errors are normally and independently distributed with mean zero and homogeneous variance sigma squared. The trouble with that kind of an experimental design is often there are sources of variability which we know exist, which we can readily identify, and we'd like to, in some sense, block out these sources of variability in our estimate of the variance. And so that brought us to the next class of experimental designs called the randomized blocks. The uh, sort of blocking variables that we're interested in are things like days of the week or different instruments or different individuals taking the data. Our mathematical model now for our observations is that we have the mean effect and then we have the block contributions. These are the impacts due to the source of assignable variability, the day-to-day -day variability or the the individual-to-individual -individual variability of different individuals are taking the data. Then, of course, there are the treatment effects. These are the effects that are the studied variable, what we're hoping to identify and find. And then, of course, as always, our epsilon ij's. Uh, perhaps you'll recall the uh, randomized block experiment that we did the other time. And uh, we happen to have uh, our uh, data here once again. This is the randomized block experiment, which there were uh, four uh, ways of uh, uh, heat treating the uh, steel. And we did it, uh, the four treatments were run randomly on each of the five days of the week. And there was some fear that there was some day-to-day -day, uh, variation uh, amongst the... Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the procedure, and so we could take out the day-to-day -day variability by this balanced design. It's a randomized block design, and we ran the four treatments randomly within each day. And you recall what the mathematical model did to us. It took the observations that we finally got, and we were able to break them up into their component parts. That 89, uh, for example, or any of those observations could be explained away in terms of the grand average, which estimated the mean, and then we got the block effects. There are the block effects for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then there were the treatment effects for the four different treatments. And finally, to make that equal sign hold, uh, we actually got through estimating the residuals. And so uh, that completely broke out the observations and we constructed the analysis of variance appropriate to this mathematical model and uh, to this breakdown of the individual observations. Now, let me play a game with you. Let's all look at the observations. All right, gang, eyeball those and tell me which of those observations is most extraordinary, most unusual. What you'll likely do in this case is look for the big ones and the small ones. Your mind will course through that data and you'll try to find the largest observations or the smallest observations. But really, the most interesting observations are those observations that do most violence to the mathematical model that we've postulated. Now. In other words, we imagine that the observations are well-behaved, and it's the misbehaving observations which give us interesting clues as to novel ideas and so forth that help, you know, tickle our imagination and stimulate our, 
our uh, thoughts as to what might be going on, to get new ideas and so on. Which of those observations do you think is most stimulating, therefore? Well, the way we answer that question is to look at the associated residuals, those observations which have the large residuals that deviate farthest away from the mathematical model. Those would be the most interesting observations. And to come back here, let's just look at the residuals. Where are the big residuals? R, there's one, the six, and there's the other one. There are two sixes, actually. Those are the largest residuals. And it's interesting to see where those two observations fall. And when we come back here, we find out it's that 92 and that 88. Those are the two outlanders, the two outstanding observations, which are most attractive. And we might go back and check our records and see if we can find any reason why that yield was particularly high and why that yield was particularly high. Maybe that's an important fact important bit of evidence which uh, might help us design the next experiment. Of course, we learned to uh, uh, study the residuals for the purposes of checking on the assumptions which underlay the analysis of variance. And what were three of those assumptions? Independence, normality, and homogeneous variance. We can help guarantee independence by being sure that the trials are run in some random order. We can check on independence by recording uh, the time sequence in which the observations are measured, and then knowing the time sequence of the observations, we can plot the residuals in time sequence and see if there are any trends or any unusual tendencies for the residuals to fall one way or another as a, as a, as a function of time. So those are two ways to check on the independence assumption. How about the normality assumption? Well, we could plot all the residuals and see if they appear to be normally distributed, or we could plot all the residuals within each one of the treatment classifications and similarly check those. Uh, what about the assumption of uh, homogeneous variance? Here we have that unusual plot where we take the residuals and plot them against the predicted values. And gang, how would you determine the predicted value for any one of these treatment block combinations? For example, what would be the predicted value for that 89 right there? Well, we could determine the predicted value by taking the grand average and adding on its block effect and adding on its appropriate uh, treatment effect. And that quantity would be the predicted value. And then we take the actual error, which was made in that, estimated in that case to be minus one. Predicted value in this case would be 88, and we'd plot the minus one against the 88. In fact, we plot all the residuals against their predicted values. Now suppose those residuals are very widespread when the predicted values are small and very narrow when the predicted values are large. This would be an indication that the variability changed as the magnitude of the response changed. And so that would be a signal of, of non-homogeneous variance. Through the study of the residuals, we can get a handle on uh, whether or not some of the vital assumptions underlying the analysis of variance are in fact held. But there's another very important assumption underlying the analysis of variance, and that is that the model is an additive model. Now, what do we mean by an additive model? And we have to answer that question with reference to the actual